Hello, welcome to our latest virtual bridge session. And I'm delighted to be joined by Steph, Sarah and Mel, um, who will be talking about the subject of an inclusive angle to students who learn online that come from a gender diverse background. And I have to say, like, I'm really, really interested in this because when I thought about it, I was like, I was thinking about the content that I write. And I, I genuinely have it in my head that I, I write, I write on a kind of gender balanced view and I try to be as inclusive as, as possible. I genuinely probably haven't thought about this particular aspect before. So this I, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued. I'm excited to hear um, what it is I should be doing because I, I feel I'm going wrong, well, somewhere, so many places actually. So Steph, <laughs> educate me. Tell me what I should be doing. Tell me where I've been going wrong all these years. <laughs> Great, okay, I will try. <laughs> so as, as Kenji said, I'm Steph McKendry and I'm the Head of Access, Equality and Inclusion at the University of Strathclyde. And I'm part of the TransEdu Community of Practice and I've got um, two co-chairs of the community along with me today. So we've got Sarah from Ayrshire College and Mel from um, Glasgow Caledonian University. And the, the plan is really that I'll talk through a very short presentation, but Mel and Sarah will be um, interrupting at any point when they've got things to, to add. And then we'll have time for, for discussion and presentation, uh, sorry, discussion and, and any questions. We were really glad to, to come along today because we've been, I was part of the original TransEdu research project that explored the experiences of trans and gender diverse learners within Scotland's colleges and universities. And so I'll talk a little bit about that and then about the, the community of practice and what we've been doing to, um, to further promote awareness of trans and gender diverse learners and look at what we can do to, to better support them. But increasingly we've been thinking as a community of the impact of COVID-19 on those specific learners and the transition to online learning and the fact that there might be particular issues and challenges for those those learners and really quite simple things we can do to um to try and better support them so so really i hope the practical focus of today is is what you can take away and simple changes you can make when doing online delivery that um that might make life just a bit easier for um for that particular group of learners so if that sounds okay, what I'll do is share some, some slides with you just now and we'll talk through those. So give me one second while I bring those up. Okay. So initially I just wanted to give an overall view of the experience of trans and gender diverse people within the UK um, in general. And what we do know is that it can be pretty bleak compared to the broader LGBT population and the general population, trans and gender diverse people um, have quite poor experience in, in all aspects of life. And the UK Parliament conducted a, a review and a trans equality report in 2016. And what they said was that people experienced higher levels of transphobia. And that was almost a reality of, of people's existence. It's what they came to, to expect. They um, were looking at further in higher education. They said that there were unacceptable levels of bullying and harassment. It's also worth being aware that um, the particular population, especially the young trans and gender diverse population, um, has a higher incidence of um, suicide and self-harm than the general LGB and, and general population. And I've included a link in the slide there for a, a very recent BBC report, which is just a five minute report talking about a quadrupling in incidents of transphobic hate crime in the last five years. And that gives, um, it's got some people who've experienced hate crime talking about what it was like to report that incident and how they were treated by the police and, and really how unlikely they are to, to report in the, in the future. So you're looking at a group who, who are potentially very vulnerable in the, in the first place. LGBT Youth Scotland have done some amazing work um, reporting on the experiences of young LGBT people and their most recently published survey was 2017 and what they found was that LGBT young people were had quite high incidences of bullying within the school, college and university environment but more so for, um, for trans young people so lots 
68% of trans young people felt that bullying had negatively affected their educational attainment and they, many young people just left school and got out of education as soon as they possibly could because of those experiences. Um, a far higher proportion of them rated their school experience as bad um, compared to other groups. And so that's where we came in with our research project. So it was funded by the Scottish Funding Council and conducted by myself and my colleague, Dr. Matson Lawrence at the University of Strathclyde um, a couple of years ago now. So we, we did the field work in 2016, 2017. And we wanted to, to look, there was, there was survey data, the National Union of Students had done a lot of work and um, people like LGBT Youth Scotland and Stormall had, but there hadn't really been anything looking specifically at colleges and universities in, um, in Scotland. And we all have statutory obligations, ethical obligations, but we didn't feel there was an evidence base on which to, um, to build activities. So we uh, pitched to the SFC and received money to, um, to take forward the, the research. And it was a, an online survey that had over 150 participants and then follow up in-depth interviews with 20 um, 20 people. And I think what's really important to see is the, the gender identity split of those participants. So we asked people to, um, whether they're identified as male, female, and um, something else, and over half of participants didn't put themselves within um, the binary of male, female. So when we're thinking about support for trans people, we really need to be thinking about gender diversity. If you only have support for trans men and trans women, you're missing out the non-binary um, or fluid identities. And that's over half the people that we're, we're trying to support. We had participants from every university in Scotland and two thirds of colleges. And um, it was pretty much the full range of levels of learning. So from that five up to PhD and, and every subject area. And we also had staff who, um, who completed the, the survey. And our main findings were, were fairly stark really. So that the first thing we asked was if participants had experienced barriers to the learning or work, that they directly attributed to their gender identity. And 86% of respondents said, yes, they, they encountered barriers either to a large extent or, or to a lesser extent. And what was really striking, um, particularly to, to myself, who, who haven't done a huge amount of research into this area before, was how low people's expectations were. So many described feelings of, of being very uncomfortable or feeling unsafe within a classroom or um, campus environment, but that they expected that and didn't really expect any better. And I, and I found that really shocking when you think of how hard we work to make the student experience as good as it can be. People were saying, you know, college is fine because I haven't been beaten up there rather than because it's an enhancing place where I feel welcome and able to, to thrive. We, we asked people if they um, were aware of, of what supports their universities had in place or, and colleges. And over 50% of respondents didn't know if their institution had a, had a policy that related to them or that any kind of support. And I think more worryingly, nearly a quarter of people felt entirely unable to approach their institution about their, um, their gender identity. So under no circumstances did they want anybody to know that they were trans, for example. And a further 33% felt only a little able to, to do so. And quite a high proportion of our respondents had withdrawn from their course or college before completion. So it's 35%, which is a, a much higher dropout rate than we would expect within um, a university or, or college setting for the general population. So um, we were quite keen that the Transit Jew project was very um, it's very active and useful for, for people. So there isn't there isn't huge amounts of writing. It isn't very particularly theoretical. What we produced was a, a practical toolkit that we published online at trans.ac.uk. And that contains the, the findings, but it's also got things that people are able to take and freely use. So we have training materials that if people want to do an introduction to um, to trans identities and gender diversity, they can take those slides and the script and do their own training sessions. There's videos where we have um, participants talking about what it feels like to be misgendered or how important it is that they have gender neutral facilities like toilets. And again, they could, that was really to give voice to people with lived experience. And we've also um, undertaken further publications. So we've got a book 
out and um, various other, other things. But probably the main thing to come out of the project was this establishment of a community of practice. So this is for anybody working within the um, college university education sector who wants to better support trans and gender diverse learners. So we do have some student associations, um, but it's, it's mainly staff so far. And we meet about three times each year. Traditionally, it was that we would move geographically around and we would have a host institution and find us a room, lay on some sandwiches and we'd all, all turn up. Increasingly, obviously, it's been online, um, which I think has worked well because we've probably had higher attendance because people only need to find that hour and a, and a half. And we either have a, a theme for the, the meeting or, or people come along with particular issues and we've had invited speakers such as Leap Sports Scotland or um, the, the people who led the, the Thai campaign. And the kind of things we've done is um, people, so Royal Conservatory of Scotland, for example, brought along their new trans and gender diversity policy, really just to get a bit of feedback, to, to share good practice. I was working on, um, along with colleagues at Strathclyde, we were looking at a, a single gender swimming session in our new sports centre and wanted to make sure that it was for anyone who identified as female or was non-binary. And I was able to kind of talk that through and get advice on how to phrase it all. We've also shared publications. So I've got the one there, it's UWS, um, has written a brilliant guide for supporting disabled students who are, um, who are trans or uh, gender diverse. And together we've also started writing um, various guidance documents. So I'll maybe stop there a second and see if Sarah and Mel wanted to come in and, and say anything about the community of practice. I was, waiting for, I, was waiting for, I was waiting for Sarah in case she wanted to talk. Um, nothing in particular, just really to say that it's been a really, really helpful um, space to, to kind of be able to, to meet with other people who I can have shown a genuine kind of concern and interest. Um, for me, as, as a non-binary member of staff, I come at it from a few angles, really. So obviously being a member of staff in, in HE myself, working in student wellbeing, and in turn supporting students who are um, disabled and, and gender diverse, it's, it's a really interesting intersection for me. So I get quite a lot from it from a personal and a kind of um, professional perspective. Um, that was it really, just to kind of say that it's, it's been a really useful thing. And I'm new to the, the co-chair role, so we'll, we'll see how that goes through this <laughs> this year. Great, thanks. Uh, I think the other thing to note is it isn't, I mean, there are people with considerable expertise that are members of the, the group, but it isn't that you need to know about this particular group or, or this particular area to join. It's, you know, people come along because they don't know anything, but they want their institution to, um, to start work on it, or they personally want to do something about it. So it isn't that it's only for, for people who already know um, what they're doing, for example. So the what we've been talking about recently, as I say, and what we, we'd really like to, to have a discussion about is how this particular community has been affected by COVID-19 and how we can better support people given, given online learning and blended learning. And, and probably there'll be elements of, of online learning that remain even afterwards. And I um, stole a quote from Mallory Blackman that um, my colleague Matson used in a presentation and you know, someone comes across a quote and you're like I'm loving that with that I think is just absolutely brilliant that there's a lot about we're all in the same boat because the entire world is facing COVID-19 but it's not really true so, so Mallory Blackman the author had said where this pandemic is concerned we're all in the same storm but we're not in the same boat some are in huge yachts and can hardly feel a ripple some are in smaller boats which are listing slightly to port some are rowing exhausted and some are in the water drowning and I think that's really, really helps me think about the different ways in which it's affected people and how some have been more affected than others. And we've seen that through various equality groups and socioeconomic factors. But I think it is worth spending a little time thinking about how trans and gender diverse students in particular might be affected and just considering that when you're planning your learning and uh, planning your teaching sorry and undertaking it and the kind of issues so we had a 
community practice meetings that looked at that and we very kindly had a, a student come along from UWS who has lived experience and she taught us about she'd spent a lot of time um, with her network asking other students how they'd found things and, and from that we, we've kind of got some key themes and the community of practice has put together a leaflet that's got some some just general advice on how to support learners and the main things we thought about were that people are now in their home environments and so they've got a lot less control over where they're learning and they may be in quite challenging home environments I mean this is true for lots of groups of learners and so anything we do if we focus on trans and gender diverse learners and supporting them will help those who are um, who have disabilities who are neurodiverse thing, um, that kind of thing what we what we've seen and colleagues in LGBT youth Scotland also saw this is that Sometimes people aren't able to engage in the same way because they're not actually out at home or it isn't safe for them to be out at home. So as much as we're saying, you know, maybe people should put their pronouns on, on Zoom and thought maybe that's not safe because somebody might walk in and see what, you know, why have you got, why have you got she, her written on your, your screen? And you might find that people that were very conversational would always talk in class, don't do so online. And again, it could be because they could be overheard and the, the student who came along to the, the session had said that she thinks there's more people from trans and gender diverse backgrounds within the humanities and social science uh, because there, there tends to be a, a wish to discuss identity and, and things. And so they're likely to be discussing topics like sexuality, sexual orientation, and, and it may not be appropriate for them to discuss that within the home, whereas they would have within a, a classroom setting. So, so to be kind of conscious of that, they might be in unsupported settings where um, people aren't aren't okay with their, their gender identity or sexual orientation. There's also a higher proportion of um, a greater incidence, sorry, of homelessness and unemployment amongst this particular population. So they may be more likely to have insecure living arrangements or be moving, you know, sofa surfing, finding it difficult to, to access digital equipment. We've seen with, with everything that as the NHS has to prioritise COVID, waiting lists get longer for, um, for non-urgent non healthcare, and that will be true of gender affirming healthcare. There were already massive waiting lists for, for people to access gender affirming healthcare, and be that hormones or, or surgery. So people were already looking at maybe 18 months just to get that initial appointment that they are and the impact that obviously has on your, your well-being, that will have been massively exacerbated. So the students that you're, um, that you're teaching may ha have all of the, the stress and anxiety that comes with knowing something that was a long way away has become even further away. And all of the, the mental health and well-being issues that all students are facing are perhaps exacerbated for this particular group because they were more vulnerable to it. And, they may not be able to have their usual support networks, so they may not be able to go along to the um, to the social sessions or their peer networks. A lot of things, a lot of support has moved online, but there are the difficulties of accessing it. If you're in a home that isn't where you're not necessarily safe talking about these things, will you sit in your bedroom accessing online counselling if you can be heard or someone knows, um, you know, someone comes and looks at what computer you've been using? And then there are the intersecting experiences. There's a higher incidence of disability and long-term um, medical conditions with this particular group. So that will compound their experiences of, of COVID-19 in general and remote, uh, remote delivery. So we've got, sorry, my dog's joining in there in the background, <laughs> apologies for that. Um, we've got a leaflet that really has six things that we suggest that everybody could, could reasonably easily do when they're delivering teaching or preparing it. And, and the first really comes from the, the earlier discussion that I'd had. It's be mindful of the environment in which someone might be, might be learning. There might be, it, it might seem like they're being intransigent or um, not particularly engaged, but there might be really good reasons for that. And is it possible for you to somehow reach out in a, um, in, a, in a relatively safe way to check on that? Or 
really just don't assume I think that if somebody isn't engaging it's because they don't want to or um, it may be something else I think also and this actually this isn't new to anybody it's provide a range of participation options there um, again there might be a very good reason why someone doesn't put their, their camera on and for this group in particular there may be issues of um, concern about gender presentation so they may not wish to I don't think anybody loves staring at themselves endlessly during sessions but this particular group might have um, really good reasons why they don't want to or it might be that their um, the gender presentation at that moment is different to how they, they usually appear within a classroom context because, because they can't for some reason or it might not be safe so they don't want other people knowing how they're presenting at that time so think about are you allowing people to um, to use chat functions or, or discussion boards and rather than having to having to speak out or have their camera on? I would say also think about how you use breakout rooms and, and group work. One of the major issues that came up within the original research was um, being put into a group without any kind of say over it so people had real concerns and, and were aware perhaps of colleagues and um, fellow students that were transphobic or that they were uncomfortable working with and were really worried when suddenly they were forced to be in a group with them so we one of our recommendations from the research was give people an opportunity to say um, before you assign them into groups actually could I could I be with these people or could I not be with those people Breakout rooms, for example, in Zoom are great, but we do tend to just shove people straight into them, um, often without warning. And so for those students, maybe just taking a bit more time and checking in with them and saying, do you want me to assign you a particular group would, would help um, with any kind of anxieties. We also think it's important, and this is a really good a good thing about online learning, um, but potentially a, a challenge as well, is thinking about how names are presented in online meetings. And it really depends on what platform you're using. So Zoom, you can change really quickly in the meeting. You've also, if you have a Zoom account, you have the opportunity to kind of hardwire what your name's going to be. So people can choose the name that they, uh, that they go by rather than perhaps their official registered name. Microsoft Teams is... Um, goes by your registered name if you have an account and it's really difficult to, to change it so um sir andrews when they launched microsoft teams among students said at that launch by the way it's going to be your officially registered name if that presents a problem here's the steps to take to and um, to change that so that everybody knew up front and they could um they could kind of get away with you know they could make any changes prior to it so depending on what platform you're thinking you're using it's worth thinking about how do names appear how can people change them um, equally you can add pronouns to some platforms and not others so you, you'll see that some of us here um, have just renamed ourselves but adding in she her they them he his and I think that's a really nice way of showing people you understand gender identity that you um, want to use the pronouns that people are comfortable with and and it really just brings awareness to everybody about gender identity it's a, it's a really easy thing and it stops any accidental misgendering and then finally our suggestion was just be be an ally talk about these things add your pronouns to your email signature if you're if you're happy to do so and those who know about it will see that as a sign of allyship and advocacy so I'll stop sharing there and let Sarah and Mel come in if you've got anything that I've missed out. I don't think Steph's missed anything out. Um, but I think, again, just to kind of emphasise some of the points that she made in terms of that context setting as well. So we already understood that trans and gender diverse um, learners and staff were already experiencing inequality. And now we're living in a, a global pandemic, which has only compounded some of those inequalities. So to flip that then to some of the points there that Steph was just raising around how can we improve things for those learners and staff and very, I'm going to use the word easy, but perhaps that's not what I mean, because I know how difficult it can be to then try change things within your institution, but they can also be easy changes in terms of um, say pronouns 
And again, just to emphasize that point made by Steph, that sometimes it's also about having your pronoun included to show that you are an informed ally, that you do understand the spectrum of gender, but also for anybody who then is experiencing something in relation to their gender identity or in relation to their home life, for example, that they know that you are someone who can support them, that they could come to. And if we want our students to stay with us through this journey, um, I did just say journey, um, that those things are simple, easy, but important. Yeah, just to, to pick up on that as well, um, just a really practical kind of example. So I've had my pronouns on kind of Zoom and, and my email signature for, for quite a while now. Um, and I've seen the ripple effect. So other colleagues in my team have started putting their pronouns on, on their emails and things like that. But I've also had students come back to me and say, you know, I was really relieved when I saw your pronouns on your email um, because it meant I felt, you know, I could talk to you about it if I had to. It's not necessarily the case that, you know, students are always going to come to you, but I think it really helps them to know they can speak to you if they need to. Or it, for me personally, it just that visibility gives a bit of a sense of, okay, this is a place where hopefully, you know, I would be safe. It just gives that little bit of reassurance. Obviously, you always never know until you actually speak with someone, but I think just little things like that can just help build a picture of somewhere being a little bit more inclusive because it just shows, like like Sarah said, that you, you just have a, a basic awareness even um, of how kind of displaying your pronouns can be quite helpful. Um, and obviously, like we said, not everyone feels comfortable doing that. So I would definitely stress that it's where people feel comfortable and I would never kind of you know force that because there are people that maybe don't know what their pronouns are or don't feel comfortable putting them on for for whatever reason but yeah just to kind of feedback that, that I have had quite a few students come back and and say they saw that and they, they kind of immediately felt quite reassured um so yeah it's quite positive just to kind of add as well just thinking about those range of, of points that Steph brought up and, and similar to what Mel's saying as well Again, thinking to that second point around um, different ways to participate within lessons and, and remote learning. Um, and I, I'm sure Ayrshire College is, is not alone in, in having challenges in terms of um, keeping students engaged. But it's then how do you employ different ways to engage students that doesn't always rely on someone potentially being seen on camera. But I understand there's a lot of negotiation with that too. Um, but again, just to kind of make that aware of how are we engaging with students um, and being sensitive to, to those who, for whatever reason, don't want to be on, on camera um, to signal that they are participating. Okay, we're, we're coming close to the end of our 30 minutes, but we do have time um, for a, a question from the group, if, if anyone has a question for Steph or Sarah or Mel. Let me start with just a question for myself. Um, in terms of the material that we produce online as part of our lessons, do you have any advice as to how we deal with pronouns in, in the written content that we make visible to students? Um, that yeah, would just be useful uh -huh. for me. <laughs> I think B is gender neutral as you can. So really, is there a reason to, to have a gender to, to something. Um, we, we recently updated a, a policy and that was actually about, it was an equality policy and it had various case studies in. And we realized we'd, we'd given everybody a gender. It was this, this female footballer, um, sports scholar has this, and we went through it and, and the, no, it's the student or the advisor. And we're, it, I think it can seem a little bit passive, but it's, there's no reason most of the time for, for things to be gendered. And so it's just much easier to go through it and make it gender neutral. Yeah, okay. I was going to say the same thing, or if you're going to put um, gender into it for whatever reason, because obviously there may be some occasions where you want to be specific, make sure you do use a range of genders and not just stick to the, the binary male and female. So if you are going to you know, use gender, really please incorporate a range because you feel really alienated when it's just he and she and you don't feature anywhere within that. Um, so just to flag that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes there's, there's concerns that, that this will lead to kind of female erasure, but it isn't, it isn't that. I think actually it helps 
with stereotypes because it stops people go the girls in the office or ladies ten, you know that tends to be quite um, quite stereotyping so the more that you you don't say ladies and gentlemen boys and girls the the better for everybody and um, our principal's actually really good I've taken his example here with his colleagues and so just getting used to using things like that I think is really helpful for people Okay, that's brilliant. And unfortunately, apologies to everyone else, but that's just taken us up to the 30 minutes. So for, for those of you joining us on YouTube, thanks so much. Uh, thanks especially to, to Steph, Sara and Mel for, for expanding our knowledge in this area. Absolutely. And I've just changed my signature. So look, <laughs> first step. <laughs> okay, so thanks for joining us for this virtual bridge session. Hope we see you again for some future session. But until then, stay safe. <laughs>